like to. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Sharing Hope Community Conversations. Uh, this is our monthly conversations with NAMI Delaware, where uh, we just get together and talk with anyone, but um, especially people of the BIPOC community, um, just about mental health, mental illness, our culture, how those things intertwine. Um, we are not therapists. Uh, well, I'm not a therapist. I'm just someone who has a lived experience living with anxiety um, and depression and just trying to use my voice to try to help others feel comfortable sharing their experiences as well. Um, but we always try to have a guest with us um, who, are, who is in the medical field. Um, for those who are joining us today, if you need it, the um, the crisis document is in the uh, chat um, and it has resources available. And of course you can always go to NAMI for additional resources. Uh, today's topic is minority mental health because it's minority mental health month. So I'm really excited that um, Chaplain Pam uh, has agreed to join me and just have a conversation. Um, Chaplain Pam, do you wanna tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Chaplain Pamela Adams. I'm the University Chaplain and Director of Spiritual Life at Delaware State University. And I also am the Spiritual Advisor of Recovery Centers of America in Waldorf, Maryland. And so I'm just excited about being here and having the conversation. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you also to everyone joining us. Um, <clears throat> so to, to get it started, um, it's Minority Mental Health and you know, of course, all mental health matters, um, but often we'll say, just like sometimes we'll say Black Lives Matter, Black mental health matters. And there's a specific reason for that because it's so undertreated, under talked about, um, under taken care of, and it's really impacting our, our community. And what have you seen a little bit around that um, as far as the, the, not displacement, but the, oh, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, like just the differences between um, the seeking of help for mental illness um, between one group versus minorities. I think that there, there's definitely a difference. There is some hesitation when it comes down to the um, people of color, black, brown, and all those shades in between in reference to us getting the type of help that we need. There is some hesitancy, as I said, we're not, we're trying, I'll say this, we're doing a lot better than what we once were. I think we have to agree that we are doing a little bit better because at least we're open to having the conversation. Platforms such as this didn't exist five to 10 years ago. We were not having conversations about mental health in the African-American community on public platforms such as this. So I definitely think there has been some improvement. Do I believe we have some ways to go? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think one area where it's helped having some improvement, you know, are professionals like you and others, because for the longest time there, and still to this day, um, there's definitely a lack of Black mental health providers. Um, and it's hard sometimes to feel like you can open up in a therapy space um, with a provider who you feel like doesn't understand you or understand your background. Like they may be well-trained, but if you have to watch what you say or how you say it, because you want to be, you don't want to be offensive, that impacts you going to therapy and your comfort level with going to therapy. Um, so that's part of why for the longest, it was viewed as like, oh, it's a white people thing um, because they were also the people who were the therapist. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that highlighting that we have more black therapists, like I love that there's the black brown therapist directory here in Delaware. I think that that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would also add to that the fact that we just, I think we're being a little bit more affirming to people that have, um, that are having different types of mental health issues in the moment and not being dismissive to people's emotions and how they feel. We're actually, um, I would say we're actually believing what they're saying and not just trying to pacify them along the lines of saying, you'll be all right, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, it's gonna be okay. Well, we're actually being a little bit more empathetic to people, I'll say, um, yeah. and not just so much being dismissive to how they're feeling and their emotions. Yeah, and I think that that is huge overall. I think well, it's so hard to say because you know COVID has been so ravishing for so many people, but I think one of the silver linings that have come out of it 
is the amount of talk around mental health and mental illness and how we are all impacted by it and people feeling more uh, open and honest to say, hey, I'm struggling or hey, I need to put myself first. Um, I think is, like I said, one of the silver linings of COVID um, mm -hmm. happening. Of course, one of the not silver linings or one of the downsides has been um, some of the, like, the suicide rates within minorities. Um, Mental Health First Aid, the, um, the publication uh, stated that CDC data shows 15% of black and non-Hispanic respondents seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days compared to 8% of whites or 10.7% of all respondents. Um, and 44% of black non-Hispanic non -Hispanic respondents reported um, that one adverse mental health or behavioral mental health symptoms compared to 38% of white and 48% of our or 40% of all respondents. So it's interesting that our numbers are so, I would say significantly higher than our counterparts in other races, but we're the group that's also significantly under underserved and not getting the help that we need. Right, least likely to get the assistance that we need because of judgment or because of just, you know, how, and we've had these conversations before about how, you know, what happens in our house stays in our house. And so being able to actually sit down and have a conversation with an outsider is not something that we were taught or we are accustomed to doing. It's very much, how can I figure this out? Me being able to do this on my own strength and not being able to show weakness because I, I know better or I, I was taught better and just the different types of things that we grew up with. And, now getting to a space where the numbers are significantly different and it's it's very astonishing because of course you know you the things that we say um in our in our culture in reference to that's black people don't kill themselves but we see here now that that very yeah. much is a thing and so to try to understand a little bit more along the lines of why this is happening like, of course we all can have all of these speculations but I wonder, is it around the fact that so much is going on in our community and that within our community, it, it's to the place of why get the help? Yeah. Why, why, why even seek out help um, with everything that's going on? Like it, it just be, it would be easier not to be here. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, of course, speculating, wonder why are the numbers so vastly different at this point in time in, in the society that we live in? Yeah, there was recently the NAMI um, conference, the national conference, and I was sharing with uh, Annie and Chaplain Pam that one of the graphs they showed was the suicide rates in New Jersey. And you see it like in the beginning of 2020 where, you know, there's the black line and the white line and they're pretty much compatible. And then you see this drastic drop in the number of white suicides and an incline in the number of black suicides. And it's really truly startling to see. And we are sort of discussing trying to, you know, as she said, speculate about, you know, some of the causes about that around that. And I definitely think part of it is environmental. You know, there's a lot of struggle, like you mentioned, we, there's a lot of things that unfortunately within all communities, but within the black communities where it's like what happens at home stays at home. And, we don't talk about that outside, but what do you do when you're stuck at home in that condition, whatever it is, whether it's, um, you know, there's tons of things, you know, poverty, um, violence, just overall unhappiness that people face in, you know, everywhere. But what happens when you're stuck with that at, um, what happens when you're stuck with that and you can't escape the house and then it becomes even more overbearing. Um, I've mm -hmm. talked before and you know, the groups that we've had here that I had some domestic violence in my childhood and school was my escape. Like school was where I went to not be stressed out and not be worried that something would happen. So I could not imagine had I been in a pandemic in that situation. So mm -hmm. I think it absolutely makes sense why the numbers are rising. And then you also mentioned a really great point on why you think the other numbers are dropping. Um, If you want to talk about that a little bit. Oh, I was just saying along the lines of, of the amount of celebrities and entertainers that are coming forward talking about the help and the assistance. And, you know, we're slowly um, in, in the African-American community, we're starting to see more celebrities and um, athletes um, taking time out for themselves to, to help check their mental health. But 
for a long time, we were constantly seeing Caucasians, um, the entertainers and the athletes coming forward saying, my mental health, seek out help, seek out help. And so now we're starting to see it, but there's still a drastic difference in um, therapy in reference to, and I mean, I'm, we don't have the time to talk about the cost, but I do believe that that also is a barrier yeah. Um, if, in reference to having insurance. And then, you know, of course, I'm always wondering when we do these types of surveys, what population, where did they live um, and things of that nature, like uh, socioeconomic status, things of that nature. Right. Do they have the insurance? And then I have a lot of clients that um, want to get therapy, but their insurance provider only allows them maybe seven sessions. And so they yeah. have these seven sessions and that's it. And then after that, it shoots out to this astronomical cost that they can't afford. And so it's like, how can I space out these seven sessions and get the assistance that I need before the new fiscal year starts so that I can get those additional seven sessions. And so I, I just think there's a numerous things that are happening that shows the reason why that these numbers are going in two different directions. And so it just, it it's imperative that we continue to have these conversations, but not only just have the conversations, but making sure we're creating opportunities for individuals to get the assistance that they need. Yeah, absolutely. The cost is definitely a huge barrier for everyone. It's not even just the insurance. There are companies that have it part of their insurance that don't tell their employees. Like um, mm -hmm. I was talking to someone the other day who said they didn't even realize that they had three sessions covered until they were in a state of crisis. And then they were told, um, I mean, three isn't a lot, but it's certainly better than none. Mm -hmm. And to not be like forthcoming, I think a lot of people don't even know how much is covered in their insurance. Um, and that's something that needs to be talked about more and also looked into more for them. Mm -hmm. um, but insurance is definitely a barrier. I like that it seems like a lot more places are offering um, uh, pro bono therapy sessions for some people. Mm -hmm. um, I know the National Institute of Mental Health is working on an app um, as I was saying, I attended the conference, the national NAMI conference the past two days, and um, someone, a representative from the National Institute of Mental Health uh, was there and they showed us the app that they're working on. And I think that's going to be a great resource um, just as far as like checking in and also getting um, advice on where to go, what to do. I think that will be, that will be helpful. Mm -hmm. I um, actually, I actually participate um, with the organization. They provide it's an app that is a part of different schools, different mm -hmm. colleges, and um, organizations like different types of businesses and things of that nature. And it has various coaches that people that work at these companies can reach out to us and have different conversations. So like life transitions, um, spirituality. Um, I get a lot of smoking cessation, substance abuse questions and things of that nature and their company pays for it. So it's free to them. So they just log on, um, select the time and you know they can book seven to how many ever minutes. And like um, you get, a, I get a lot of those calls especially um, when we were right at the height of COVID it, my phone was constantly going off because sometimes people just needed somebody to talk to to just yeah. balance, you know, bounce some ideas off of the things that are going on in their head and where are these thought, thoughts and feelings coming from. So there are things out there that a lot of people sometimes don't know about. And even in, in different um, organizations, I think it's like EAP, where there are actually resources available through jobs, but we have to seek out the help. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a lot of times the help is just not going to show up on our front door. If you're feeling something, and you know, I always say, I work with college students, so they're always like, Chaplain Pam, I feel some type of way. Well, if you feel some type of way, let's talk about it and try to figure out what's going on so that we can get you the appropriate help. But if you feel something, I think you need to say something. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it goes back to the, the history that's sort of been set within our community about being strong, being tough, like those aren't our problems, your feelings, get over it, work and just move past it being like the strong black woman or the strong man. And um, that pay, plays a toll on it. Like no matter how strong you are, what happens in your environment impacts you. Um, I know last year with the George Floyd and all of, you know, everything that was going on with that, like it was really hard for me. It was, it was difficult seeing that much pain constantly. And like you were saying also, um, you know, what do you do when you feel like you don't have anywhere to 
like things aren't getting better you know like those situations are always hard for me but I think if you'll remember like the George Floyd happened like right either the same day or um yes um someone just asked in the chat if they can participate in the conversation absolutely Please. this part's recorded but as long as you're fine with that you can definitely participate if you're not comfortable with that we'll probably be turning the recording off soon and you can do it then but but either time we're happy to have you um i was saying oh yeah so with the george floyd it happened like right on the tail of the incident in the park where the person was bird watching and the cops were called mm -hmm. on the person for bird watching um, and it had been a few weeks after the jogger, but I remember for me, it especially struck me hard because like, we're always told that like, oh, just be good. Like, like be this certain type of way, right? Respectable, respectability politics is always hurled at us. You know, like if you talk a certain way, if you act a certain way, like, you know, we're almost demonized almost for our culture and our blackness. And it's, you know, it's too rough. It's too gangster, it's too thug, it's too, it's too whatever. But like you have someone bird watching in the park, like the nerdiest thing you could be doing, like, so, you know, not um, threatening and like that is still a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, and then to follow that right up with seeing George Floyd, it's almost like what could have happened had that other situation escalated. So it was it was really hard and it's, up, it's upsetting to me that people feel like they should be able to just forge through that, like that shouldn't impact you. I mean, I know it impacts me every time I see a situation like that. I see my brother or I see my nephew, or if it's a black woman, I see myself. And that's how it is, I think, for most people. And I think that that has a huge impact on our mental health, um, especially in general, but especially during COVID while we're stuck at stuck at home. Mm -hmm. I think we are often... Um, Robina, oh, did you, did you want to oh, add something? Uh, yes, uh, sorry that I was late. Um, I just wanted to talk about, uh, mention how you said, you know, employees can reach out with that service that they provide to help them get some mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always hesitant to do that. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, someone in my family uh, came to me and asked me about that. Because, you know, especially in this culture where uh, mental health is so associated often with violence. You know, when someone goes and shoots up the office, the first thing they go to is, well, he had a mental health condition and people with mental health shouldn't be allowed to arm themselves. So um, even though those resources are there, I, you know, I, at least within the workplace, mm -hmm. I always think that a person should try to go outside of the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I have made those recommendations for that very reason. They don't want to be stigmatized or they don't want to be You're judged. breaking up a little bit on my end, but I think I, I heard most of that, which is that, I think, is it my who, who was breaking up, me or uh, the chaplain? You were, and now you're, you're, I can kind of hear you. I'm not sure if it's my internet or yours. Um, I think it might be yours because I'm here now. Chaplain, play. Do you hear the chaplain? I heard hers, but there was a little bit of a delay. But yeah, as long as you're able to hear, it might just be my internet that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I was saying I do. I do have individuals that come to my office, and we try to find them the appropriate resources that may be outside of the institution for the very reason of judgment or um, they don't want to be labeled and things of that nature so that they can get the assistance that they need. Um, I, I think there, are, and I can understand that because you don't, especially depending on where you work, how small it is, how big it is, all of those different things come into play. My, my prayer is that the people just get the assistance that they need and we find um, the best resource for them that um, meets their needs. Definitely. And then I, I would also say that every therapist, just because they are African-American, may not be the therapist for you either. And so don't allow that one interaction discourage you from still seeking out the support. Because to me, it's you, you, the vibe has to be appropriate. And I tell people all the time, I may not be able to meet the needs that you have. And so let's find that person 
if I'm not able to assist you in your process so that we can get you what you need. It, it has to work. You have to be able to be transparent. You have to be able to, um, to begin to develop a level of trust. First and foremost, you have to be able to communicate with that person. If you all are speaking two different languages, it's very difficult. So I think seeking the, ther the, the type of assistance that you need and then making sure that that person, you're going to feel vulnerable enough and transparent enough to be able to get the help that you need. Because it's it's to me, to have someone come and sit on the couch and I say, well, how are you doing? I'm fine. Well, if you're fine, beloved, why are you here? <laughs> we need to figure out what's going on so we can assist. Because, you know, every right. every day is not going to be rainbows and sunshines. We're going to have some dark clouds. But I believe after the dark clouds leave that the rainbow can form. So let's figure out what we need to do to deal with the dark clouds. So when the rainbow comes, I we know that it's going to come, right? Sorry. Can, oh, um, I, my son was recently diagnosed with schizophrenia. He's 21. Mm -hmm. He was basically diagnosed during the pandemic. So he's been getting um, like um, own once a month kind of check in things. And we just got him um, situated with a program called Connections. Now, I've been just learning a lot more as a family member of um, or a parent. I mean, my sister was also diagnosed with schizophrenia, so I was somewhat familiar, but now living in Delaware, I'm just getting more familiar with the resources. Um, also, I would I would like to make so, like somewhat of an announcement that we're planning an outreach event in September in Wilmington for um, not only it, mental health is is going to be it's from the Disciples of Faith Ministries with Apostle Walker, and um, mm -hmm. we're we're looking at it's called um, healing our community, mind, body, and soul, and I because of what I do, I'm a retired history teacher. I was a history teacher for 26 years in New Jersey, but I wrote books on finding healing through faith, love, and charity, which is um, basically looking at our healing at, from, from self-care and journaling. And um, so we're, we're trying to also look at helping the caregivers of the mentally ill find ways to decompress and be able to be there for their loved ones because what we came into um, you know resistance with is that because our loved one is an adult we weren't able to do certain things that we may feel was for the his best interest so it was a lot of um, learning as far as how we can help and you know, we're on our way, but off of that, you know, we, we realize that if, if we're going through this and we're somewhat knowledgeable, uh, what about the people in the community that really don't have as many resources or connections or whatever? So, so we're planning that event and I hope to, to I will reach out um, to give you more detail but that to be separate 11th and we're just waiting on the okay for this space but that's going to be in Wilmington and we just set, set this up last Saturday so it's like brand new but those are the kind of things that um you know that that we need because again we all many of us are touched by it but I talked to people and I don't know about that you know they didn't even want to talk about you know, um, met, like they, they were like, well, I don't know anyone with mental health issues. I said, well, maybe they're not diagnosed, but I'm sure you know someone, <laughs> you know, but that was the attitude, you know, so I, you know, but I want to thank you for doing this because I found this trying to find a support, the support group through NAMI. And I saw this and I said, oh my God, that's perfect timing. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And you have to make sure you get us the information so that we can support this event um, that you all are having. Because I yeah. do think that that's another piece of it, um, supporting the individuals that are having to support the individuals that have, um, that have, you know, loved ones that have mental health issues. And what does that look like? And are they getting the support? And I know Miss Annie just put in the chat box, there actually is a support group for caregivers um, that are um, taking care of or assisting 
their loved ones that have mental health issues. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, definitely. Um, and also, I'm sorry, I apologize. My computer just, it's been a day. It's been a day. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention, um, you know, when Rubina was talking that she mentioned about violent crimes and mental health. And it's actually, it's a very unfortunate stigma because only 14% of violent crimes are actually attributed to people with mental illness where it's caused by that, but where it's portrayed over the news and over the media, um, like it's, you know, a majority of them. And then even from there, if you take down like the racial breakdown, um, I, had, I pulled the stats because it's just, I wanted to make sure I didn't get it wrong, but on any given day, black people are six times more likely than white people to be incarcerated in the United States and 63% of black people in local jails um, across the country have some form of mental health condition. This was as of 2000, um, 2006. In Los Angeles, uh, black people make up 9% of the county, uh, but 43.7% of the jail population is diagnosed with serious mental illness. Um, so that speaks to the criminalization of mental illness, right? So, um, oh, did I not say 4%? Uh, yeah, so it's 4% of violent crimes, but um, it just speaks to the criminalization and how that it especially impacts community of color. Um, you know, we, we heard six on any given day, there's six times more likely to be arrested. And then when you incorporate mental health and mental illness into that, it becomes a problem and a struggle. And unfortunately, sometimes it creates that fear with law enforcement who should really be our partners in sort of figuring this out and trying to work together. It creates a fear for them because you don't know if the person coming is well-trained in this and well-versed in this or if it's someone who's gonna panic and then you're you know, on the, on the wrong side of this. And I think that that stops people and impedes them from getting the help that they frequently need also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree uh -huh. with that. Yeah. Dr. Holly, so you have your hand up. Um, did you want to speak? Yes. Um, two points. <clears throat> One of the reasons I believe that African American males in particular, more than speaking for, for African American males, don't see, seek help is because they will be looked at as soft. A lot of folks are walking around with mental health issues that don't even know it. And they would not take the time to check it out. Um, for the last, since November, we have been, my agency have been calling folks and trying to get people enrolled into what New Jersey called that called New Jersey or New Jersey Family Care. The majority of individuals who, who contact us um, are, are white individuals or, 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 or make people from India, uh, bl black individuals are not interested in, in um, healthcare, they're not interested in mental health. Um, and, and that's a shame. Um, I run, well, I'm asked to, um, through, through, my, through the um, Mental Health Association of New Jersey to do a men's wellness group. And I can't get any man to join the group. Mm. Oh, no. It's a shame. Yeah. The other point I would like to make is that um, I deal with anxiety and, and PTSD. And um, when I came, when I was fired from my job in Little Rock, Arkansas, being a student, I came back and I just needed to talk to somebody. Um, my therapist at the vet center, at first I thought she was a, a very light-skinned African-American woman. Then I thought she was a very, she was Hispanic. And we got along extremely well. It, is, it, was a, it was a connection that, that I would not have thought would have happened. She happens to be Italian. <laughs> so, so Chaplain Pam, I, I thought, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a Black person that you are dealing with. It could mm -hmm. be anybody, as long as you have that connection with that individual. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Oh, thank you for joining us. I, it's unfortunate that you've had such a hard time, you know, getting men to join the program. I think that there are especially a group that need that help and need that support. Um, in Delaware here, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit, Every Man Counts. Um, and so whenever I can, I needle in some 
some mental health stuff in there. I'm like, you're gonna, you're gonna get mental health advice along with dad advice. Uh, Cause I think it's important and it all plays a role. Like it all plays hand in hand. How are you supposed to be a pillar for your family a support for your community um, if you're struggling mentally? Um, and like you said, I think people don't wanna be seen as soft but it's not soft, it's, it's feelings we all have. It's something that we all go through and talking about it, it does, it does help. Um, and I think the reason I also always promote therapists and trying to get therapy is that it's not just talking it out. It's about getting the tools that you need to help because you can vent to a friend, but does your friend know how to help you work through those thoughts and through those feelings? Also with a therapist, I think sometimes venting and talking to someone who's third party takes away a little bit of that judgment. You know, when you're talking to a friend or family, you're like, well, I don't want them to think this way about me or see me a certain way if I think this way. Talking to a therapist or a counselor, I feel like helps you take away from that because they're not impacting your actual life. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always trying to advocate it. And I think a lot of it isn't just that they're not interested. You know, the black and brown community, I think it's a lack of knowledge about what's available to them, where mm -hmm. they can get help, who they can talk to. Um, and so I'm, I'm big on trying to just let them know those resources are available available to them. Um, I want to make sure that we have enough time to have conversation off, you know, camera as well. I think we've had a really great discussion. Um, Chaplain Pam, if there's anything else that you would like to, to add um, on this topic, we'd love to hear from you. I mean, we're going to talk more in just a mm -hmm. moment, but as far as for those who are watching this later. I just want to make sure that everyone that needs the assistance that they, they need, that they're seeking it out the best way that they can and calling um, NAMI um, if they need help. Please get the find the resources. And I'm pretty sure Ms. Annie and them will make sure that they get what they need. So if you need something, please say something so that you don't have to do this all by yourself. Yes, you absolutely don't. And the resources are available. NAMI is a great resource. Um, the Black Brown Delaware Therapist, which is just www.blackbrowndelawaretherapist, is also a great resource if you want to try to find a therapist that looks like you. Um, NAMI is always available. I'm here to talk. Um, you can find me. I'm, I basically live on Instagram, um, that African butterfly. But, you know, sometimes people DM me and just want to have a conversation. Uh, I'm available for that or to help connect you with somebody else. I'm always trying to connect people um, if, they, if they want. So definitely reach out to us, reach out to NAMI. Um, and we will be back again next month, uh, the last Thursday of each month. We love, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you. Um, but we also would love to have you here in the room with us so that you can be a part of these community conversations. But have a great day.